not very good with this microphone thing, so be patient with me. So I'll be talking about what we commonly call the Christmas Truce of 1914, which, as I discovered more and more, I kind of fell down a rabbit hole, is much more complex than you might imagine, and maybe not quite as important as you assumed it was. Um, as every good history class starts, give you a general overview of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about World War I, which took place between July 4, uh, 1914 and November 1918. Uh, at the time, it wasn't called the World War. It was commonly called the Great War, or the War to End All Wars. Uh, kind of give an overview. By the end of this period, 17 million people died, and 20 million people were wounded in action between what we call at that time central powers, which was Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, what was left of it, and Bulgaria. And then the Allies, France and the United Kingdom, and for a period of time, Russia. They did eventually leave the war uh, later because history has a good sense of humor. Japan and the United States were also allies during the world, First World War. Uh, and kind of give an overview of what started the war, why there was a war in the first place, is that the 19th century in Europe was rough. They uh, were fighting a lot. Uh, it kind of started with the Napoleonic Wars in the beginning, uh, between about 1803 to 1815, between France and everybody else. <laughs> um, excuse me. <clears throat> and then you have the Franco-Prussian War, which was specifically between Germany and France, and France lost. And they lost a uh, portion of Europe called Alsace Lorraine, and they were pretty bitter about that, and you probably could ask them now, and they probably are still pretty bitter about it after all these years. Uh, there were treaties, there were a lot, of, a lot of treaties between all these different countries at the time. Germany was having a treaty with Russia, but they didn't really like it. They didn't, weren't getting what they wanted out of it, so they had a treaty with Austria-Hungary, so Russia said, well, okay, fine, you don't want to be our friend, we will go be friends with your enemy France. That's why you have all these kind of different groups of people, and then you get to World War II, and then you have a whole other conglomeration of people on different sides. Uh, you have the end of the Ottoman Empire, was is kind of progressing along as the uh, century turned, partly because of just, you have this large area and population size was too big to control partly interference from European colonial powers who kind of had an interest in some of the supplies and resources that were available in that part of the world. Prior to World War I starting, you had various little wars, little battles that occurred because of this. That included uh, the fights in Morocco in 1905 and 1906 and 1911. Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1908, the Italo-Turkish War of 1911 and 1912, and the Balkan Wars of 1912 to 1913. So pretty much, this isn't coming out of a void. It's not suddenly, oh, we're gonna have this war. It, they, they've been having trouble for about 100 years. This is the culmination of that. You know, during the 19th century and early 20th century, they were having an arms race. They were preparing for a war that they weren't planning on, but they were being prepared. The leaders of these various countries, basically, they knew a war was coming. They just didn't know what was going to be the instigating factor to it. They came up with some pretty disturbing ideas prior to the war that they decided to implement, like the concept of total war, which is when you think of like World War I and II and Vietnam and Korea is that concept where everything is at war not just the soldiers, you have the civilians, you have every bit of infrastructure and economies focused on the war. As such, everything is up for grabs, everything is a target. That's why you have massive bombings in civilian areas in World War II, and World War I not as much bombing, but basically we're just gonna walk through these countries and take them over and destroy everything, because everything is up for grabs, and that's kind of instigated. I, can't pronounce the word, but it's German. They sort of instigated the concept of it as just, if we're gonna go to war, we're going all out, everything is about the war. And as, we're, as they were heading towards World War I, they 
pretty much believed that if a war occurred, it was going to be the end of civilization. It wasn't a, you know, there's that concept, oh, it'll be done by Christmas. And the leaders of these various countries in the military were pretty sure that this was it. This was Armageddon. This is the end of civilization. There's no coming back from this. And one could have a lot of arguments as to whether or not in the end, after 100 years, they might have been right. So the war starts in what they call the Kilai Crisis of 1914. A common thing that people know is the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria. He was going to be eventually the ruler of the Austria-Hungary Austria Empire. He was assassinated by a Bosnian Serb nationalist because it was all these, you know, Austria-Hungary wanted to take over these areas to expand their empire, and they had all these nationalistic feelings of we're finally out of the Ottoman Empire, we're finally free, and now you guys want to come in and take over? Uh, nope, they were not very happy about that. So, gentlemen decided to assassinate the Archduke. So as I said, there's a lot of treaties, there's a lot of agreements. The United Kingdom had a casual agreement with France and Russia. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're hanging out, we're helping each other. And then this dude get, gets assassinated. And it's like sort of instigating everything. Everybody starts fighting each other. Who's gonna fight who? Where are we gonna start? Well, Austria-Hungary decided to just go all out and they started fighting first. <coughs> Excuse me. And they invade Serbia in July of 1914. So, kind of, because the Christmas truce is really only 1914, and we're kind of focused during that period, um, it was a very Western Front-centric situation at that time, and there were a total between, it was really August of 1914 to November, December of 1914, there were a total of eight major battles. Uh, there's what's called the Battle of the Frontiers, which was basically Belgium and, and France, and they had, which culminated going to the race to the sea, which was trying to basically control everything in Belgium and, and the old border of France up to the North Sea. There was, and this depressed the crap out of me, when I read this, uh, the first Battle of Marne, i.e. there were more, in September of 1914, and the first Battle of Ypres in October and November 1914. And this is the beginning of what we know as trench warfare because they basically stalemated. They would be sitting there for the next four years in these trenches because they were not moving. They were just not making any headway whatsoever. The Eastern Front was different. They didn't have trench warfare and that was a lot more going into Russia, coming out of Russia and things like that. But on the Western Front, they were stuck. They were stalemated. There was not gonna be any moving. They basically were fighting over a few miles of border for four years. So that's where you get <clears throat> the horrors of the, what we think of a World War I. The things that when you think of World War I, you think of trench warfare. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie All Quiet on the Western Front, the original one from the 30s. It's a pretty accurate description of what was going on. But the trench warfare was disgusting. You had disease, you had infection. There was what they called trench fever, which now epidemiologists have said at least a million people were infected by. Basically called caused headaches, hallucinations. Uh, you had gangrene, you had parasites, you had rats spreading disease, and you had nervous and mental breakdowns, or what we know as shell shock, which nowadays we would know as PTSD, which led to the, in, on the British side, the execution of about 300 people for shell shock because of cowardice, and they were punished appropriately, usually being shot by their fellow officers. So can I give you an overview of, it, well, it's not great to be a soldier in 1914 in the Western Front in the trenches, but this concept of a Christmas truce is not special. During the war, they had multiple truces or ceasefires because they wanted to collect their debt. They wanted to help the wounded soldiers that were in the no man's land. So they were actually stopped fighting a lot. And they had a concept called, right on right over here. Um, what's it called, I wrote it down. I think it was Live and Let Live, which
which basically meant during meals, during washing time, to collect the dead, collect the wounded, they stopped fighting. So actually in the first part of the war, you could have tea and you wouldn't be shot. Things that do change in time as things get a little less pleasant between the two sides. But at the time, they, they stopped. They would stop to fight at rational times and they would help each other out in those times. And this sort of culminated in this Christmas truce because it's Christmas time. It's time to celebrate, you know, they're, even though they're on different sides of this war, they are culturally very similar. They are Christian nations, they do all celebrate Christmas. And it was really, the officers and the high up people and apparently Adolf Hitler really didn't like this. They were not very happy that the lowly soldier was talking to their, you know, comrade on the other side. It was, you know, you're supposed to be at war. They're not supposed to stop for tea. But they still did it. <laughs> they still would stop and talk about, you know, share letters from home. A lot of Germans uh, actually had lived in the United Kingdom and had friends and family who still lived in Britain. And so they would, you know, share letters because the German couldn't send a letter to Britain. Britain couldn't send a letter to Germany. So they would kind of bypass the system so it starts, this Christmas truce, it actually starts with some outside of the battlefield discussions. You have separatist movements on both sides uh, writing what they called the uh, Open Christmas Letter, which is 101 British separatists wrote uh, to the women of Germany and Austria. That's how they started it. And they had to send to America in order for it to get to Germany to be published, because America at the time was a neutral country and they needed to do that. And the suffragists, even before this period, had always been very wanting the war to end, these very vocal suffragists. So they wrote this open letter basically saying this is the time of year that we should join together and we should beg for a period of truce, if not the whole end of the war. <clears throat> and he also had Pope Benedict the 17th actually wrote a letter begging for an official truce and that said that the guns may fall silent at least upon the night the angels sang and this is how war works it was officially rebuffed by all the various military leaders from both sides but that didn't really matter because the lovely soldier had different ideas it was Christmas it was time to celebrate. And it wasn't just in like one area, it was all along the western border. Various camps started singing carols, they just stopped and they you know, allowed the Red Cross to do their business of collecting the wounded and dead. And they started, you know, they would just go over and visit each other and they would exchange gifts. It was talking about one gentleman who said that they talked to each other and one, one of them admired the buttons on someone's coat and so they exchanged coat buttons. Things like that. These little <coughs> bitty, bitty things that we don't think about. Uh, they uh, estimate about 100,000 British and German troops actually participated in it. Uh, the concept that some people have talked about there being football matches in the no man's land, uh, there's not really evidence that that actually occurred. They might have tried to play games but the weather wasn't exactly right for it. It was muddy, disgusting, and wet, so they probably actually didn't do any of that sort of thing. Um, in Ypres, the Germans decorated their side of the trench for Christmas, and they started singing carols and doing all these sorts of things. So it was very spontaneous, but it was part of a larger trend that they would take breaks. They would not be constantly fighting, despite what orders came down from high telling them to fight. Um, <clears throat> They exchanged tobacco, and I had this great little thing I wrote down that someone wrote to their mother, and he was 19 years old, and it said, Dear Mother, I am writing from the trenches. It is 11 o'clock in the morning. Beside me is a coke fire, opposite me a dugout with straw in it. The ground is sloppy in the actual trench, but frozen el elsewhere. In my mouth is a pipe presented by the Princess Mary. In the pipe is tobacco. Of course, you say. But wait, in the pipe is a German tobacco. Ha ha, you say, from a prisoner or found in a captured trench. Oh dear, no, from a German soldier. Yes, a live German soldier from his own trench. Yesterday the British and Germans met, 
shook hands in the ground between the trenches and exchanged souvenirs, shook hands. Yes, all day Christmas day. And as I write, isn't it marvelous, isn't it? And this was a young man writing to his mother. So it was, you know, this, this nice little thing that occurred. Nothing necessarily special. They do kind of, in the United Kingdom especially, kind of put this heightened thing. The irony being is the Germans actually were the ones that initiated most of the truces and initiated the Christmas truce. But the UK do kind of show, act like it's this special moment of time. But it was really just part of the trend that they would stop fighting to just do the basic maintenance. I mean, can you imagine if they didn't collect the wounded and dead, how it would have been worse. Um, it did happen a little bit on the Eastern Front, but because they didn't have the trenches the same way, it wasn't quite as extravagant and well known. And also, it kind of have America to blame for why we even know what occurred. Some people wrote stories and things of that, and they sent it to the New York Times. Again, because the United States was a neutral country, they could publish things from both sides. And that's where a lot of the stories come from, this published New York Times article that came out about a week after Christmas, where they actually, you know, talked about the stories and kind of maybe conflated some of it more than it actually was, especially the football match thing. Apparently, like, the official football clubs in the United Kingdom, like, put memorials up, but there's actually no evidence that it actually occurred. So, i.e., the media had a bit to say into making this story like maybe a bit bigger than it was. Unfortunately, uh, after 1914, the uh, officers and commanders of the various militaries kind of were trying to stop this kind of behavior. They did have, they did have to clean up the wounded and the dead, so they did have truces like that. But this concept of stopping at any time just to clean up, just to take a break, they really didn't like it. The, again, total war. Every single part, every day, every moment is about this fight. And then you have. You have 1916, which has a couple of the larger battles of World War I, including the Battle of Somme and the Battle of Verdun, and that's when they introduced the poison gas. And once they introduced that, Germans and British, they weren't really going to be friendly anymore. There's no possible way because of how horrible things were now getting for those hostilities to be really broken. So they're, there's like instances where at like Christmas Day they did stop so they could have their meal, but pretty much it wasn't going to happen. And it's the same in you know World War II. They periodically stop at Christmas time, but really total war, complete and utter. Every moment of your day is fighting this war, so that it is special in that it's it shows that they could take a moment and actually hold you know, joint burial services and things like that. But in the end, it was, it was part of a larger trend and it went away because things just, it was, it was horrible. I mean, this is not, I don't think that we can understand it 100 years past because we don't have anyone alive that can tell us these stories anymore. And that is pretty much it. It's not that complex of a story, but it's a nice story to hear that there are moments of humanity where people can maybe stop for a minute and take a breath and share in something that has meaning for them. And I think that that's pretty evocative for the entire this time of year, regardless of religious bent or not, is that we can all take a break and just be with each other. So I think that's kind of the moral of the story for this.